Bang, bang. What's going on, guys? Hope you guys are really excited about this interview. I really enjoyed it. I think you will as well. But before we get into that, make sure that you like this video so that more people on YouTube can find it. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And don't forget that BlockFi is the sponsor today. They've got three products. You can buy and sell crypto on their crypto exchange. You can deposit crypto and earn up to 8.6% APY in an interest-bearing account. Or you can deposit crypto and take out a US dollar loan against your crypto collateral. You can use the description right here, or you can go to BlockFi.com slash POMP to learn more. All right, let's get into this episode. I hope you guys enjoy this one. All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got Chrisman here. Today, we are going to tell you about the future of education. How are you? Doing well. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. Uh, let's first start with uh, the problem in the education system, which I think is plentiful. There's two mm. ways that we can do this. We can either say the politically correct stuff and explain how the school system does a great job educating students, or we can go down the truthful path, which is they actually might be doing more damage than good. Which path do you want to go down? <laughs> I think it's, uh, you know, it's important to state that you have basically like a bad system here, that systems are separate from people, that a lot of people, you know, I met a, a ton of people working in the system. I don't actually know anybody who defends the system. People who work in it don't like it. Uh, they're as much trapped as anybody else. Um, but I do agree, I mean, it's maybe less politically correct to say, but this, this uh, what I call the industrial education complex, what the is system that? that we have now, that's, that's the system uh, that looks like, you know, it's set up like a factory, right? It's, it's set up to, many people say this, like meet the needs of the industrial age. So you get kids in there, you teach them to follow rules and procedures. Most people say that's a, that, that is to train them to work in factories. And that's only half the truth, actually. Part of it is to get kids to be ready to work in factories and learn to obey the rules and operate by a bell so you can keep the machines running. And the other part is to teach them to operate large bureaucracies before the digital age. Like bureaucracies are essentially distributed computers. Every person in that bureaucracy is like, like a chip. They have no agency. They're just meant to follow out, follow instructions, follow procedures, obey the rules. Obey the rules is the number one number one uh, kind of raison d'etre of that system. And now we're transitioning into the, the information age and we just, we need a new system. The, the old one is not going to adapt. I mean, I think it's, people have been talking about changing it for a hundred years now. It's maybe, you know, been a little bit uh, off, but uh, it, it needs to change and, and it needs to change quickly. Uh, I have kids, you know, I, well, as soon as they were born, it was like, I started kind of scheming on like, how am I going to keep them out of this system? And, uh, and what does a new system look like when we have, you know, unlimited access to information? And so before yeah, we talk, my... before we talk more about the education system, you've been working on this stuff for a while, explain kind of your background and some of the work that you've done so that people don't think that there's just two dudes up here sitting, you know, bashing a system that we don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, you know, before, before synthesis, I started, a I started an online tutoring company, um, this is about about like eight eight years ago or so. So it's a little bit uh, the world world's not not quite ready for that yet. You had to most of the work was just like convincing people that you could learn online. W once they did that, it worked. Um, but it was just it was this big you know mental hurdle, which which COVID has kind of wiped that out now. So now the timing is is much better to do something in online learning. Um, but I had uh, after starting that, that really wasn't going anywhere. I met uh, I met the guys at Class Dojo, the founders of that company, which is now you know, like a couple thousand users at the time. And it's since grown to like 51 million. It's an app for uh, teachers to communicate with parents. And so through doing that, you know, you're working on basically like, you know, plugging into the existing system and, and, and trying to make it a little better. And, and, you know, it, it does that, right? Like teachers can communicate with, with parents, like that makes the kids and the families like more individuals to the teacher and not just like, you know, cogs in this giant machine. So I think that was, uh, you know, that's like an important step. And, uh, you know, through doing that, I got to talk with probably, you know, thousands of teachers, principals, administrators, parents, and really kind of, you know, wrap my head around the problems with the system and, and you know, the opportunities. And, you know, eventually kind of came to the conclusion that I would be, it just didn't, didn't really fit my personality, right? Like I, I'm more like, let, let's blow things up and start over. Let's rethink this from, from first principles. Uh, so I spent about eight years there and uh, ended up meeting Josh, my co-founder, when I went down to uh, visit at Astra School, which is the school that he built with Elon Musk on the SpaceX campus. 
And uh, that kind of started the process of, you know, getting my mind rolling on the next thing. So Class Dojo is, in a generalized way, an evolutionary approach to improving education. What you're doing now is much more revolutionary, right? It's much more disruptive and kind of changing of a paradigm versus just simply improving in small steps the existing system. Um, inside these schools, it's pretty insane. Like, I don't think people realize, again, like what happens on a day-to-day basis and, no. um, you know, when you and I first started talking, like the first thing that hit me in the head was I always joke that like, I don't know, first grade through like, maybe they still get you to do it in like eighth grade is literally you put a finger over your mouth and you put right. a finger in the air and you walk down the hallway. Right. Uh, and it's just like this weird thing of like, be quiet, sit still, do what we tell you. Uh, and the entire purpose of you being here is so that at the end of the year, you pass a end of year test. And if we do that, that's successful. Uh, it doesn't matter if you actually learned anything. Doesn't matter if you had fun. Nothing. Like, why is that the model? It's it's the logic of the industrial era, right? Where human beings are are just kind of like items to be processed, right? And it and it's it's uh, it's dehumanizing to everybody involved. Like, but particularly, I think the the real damage is done to the kids because you're just you're you're essentially like trying to grind down their humanity so they can operate within this larger industrial system. And, you know, now the world, the world's changing like that, that old, that path might've actually worked for people. Like it, it, it did work for people. If you put your head down and you follow that path and you went to a good college and you get a good job at a consulting firm or on wall street or as a lawyer or something like that, you know, it's not, not a bad way to go. You could get, uh, you, you could do well like that. You could, you could buy a home, you could raise a family and, you know, maybe it's not that bad, but it's, it's the world's not that way anymore. It's actually, you take you, what you're doing, you're, you're an individual, no one can do exactly what you do. You do this weird mix of things that like nobody predicted. And there's more and more that is the way, that's the direction of the economy. It and feels like the old system is built to teach people what to think, not how to think. Is that a fair kind of framing of it? Yeah, I think I think it's, it's uh, you know, it really, it, they're trying to get you to rely on on authority, right? Like there is some authority and they're going to be able to give you the truth. And, you know, independent thinking is... Uh, is not something that's valued because that that blow up the industrial economy. You need people to kind of buy into this this thing where you're like a cog that's going to go work in a factory or bureaucracy. And so it's uh, that you know they, they're there. It's going to be hard to uh, kind of unwind that set of ideas within the existing system. I think we need to just rethink it based on what what does the world look like now that the internet is kind of coming into its own. So in a normal day for. I don't know. I think the average age of a kid in synthesis is like 10 years old, right? Mm-hmm. Third, fourth grade. Oof. Uh, when you think about their day, the kids are free to do whatever they want for 30 minutes a day, an hour a day. Yeah. This is crazy. Cause I'll, I'll tweet stuff about the, the existing system and like my, my kind of problems with it. I think that and, you're and, way too nice. By I, the way, you should dial up the tweets a little bit. <laughs> It does seem like the more what you call controversial ones seem seem to do better. People, you know, there's at least some people that resonate with that. But the comment I get is is crazy, which is like uh, kids need school to be socialized. And I, I just it hit me the other day because my son, because we we moved during COVID, so we didn't have a lot of friends in the area we moved in. So we put him in a school, like a you know, normal, normal kind of school. It's a private school, but even private schools go by the same kind of logic. And he's in there and he just like you know, he, he hates it. He like fakes a stomach ache to like get out of going to school at least initially. And then, then he starts kind of, he starts being a little more eager to go. And I'm like, well, what's your, why do you want to go to school now? And he's like, you know, today's a PE day. So we get PE today for 30 minutes or I want to go, you know, I have lunch with my friends and there's like 30 minutes where I can like talk to my friends. And so it just occurred to me like this, we're doing this horribly evil trick on kids where the thing that they crave most is like that social development, that social interaction. And we gate it. We give them 30 minutes a day. And then we gate it behind like sit in a chair for another seven hours and just kind of listen to someone talk at you and do this work that you're not interested in and you don't want to do. But we entice them with like, this is the only way that you can be around other kids. And it's horrible. And I think we will look back, you know, once when we when we blow that system up and we'll be like, I cannot believe that we institutionalized our children like that. I, I can't believe we did it. That's the way I feel. I'm going to say this and people are going to get mad, but that's okay. Uh, Cause I think it to be true. Schools are essentially acting as, uh, the same way that a prison would act for a nonviolent offender, 
right? Meaning that there is uh, segregation of them from people that they want to talk to, hang out with. Uh, they are allowed to inter- or interact with each other for certain periods of time. But other than that, it's basically what the top-down kind of hierarchical structure uh, wants them to spend their time doing. So uh, in a prison, go to recess or go to the yard, go eat, go here in the classroom. Like you follow this very regimented process and it's desire to engineer an outcome, right? One is a control-based outcome. The other is a uh, hopefully rehabilitation outcome. It almost feels like in some weird way, what we're doing is we're putting kids into the same similar regimented environment and we're trying to engineer a rehabilitation of them from a normal human, a normal child and get them to conform to what we want them to do at the end. Is that yeah. crazy to think of it that way? I think, I think that's, I think that's right. I mean, it, it's important to, you know, realize that there's, there's this continuum, right? Between individual like freedom and liberty and kind of uh conformity. And we, and we need, there's some degree of conformity that's good, right? Mm-hmm. And I would just say it's, uh, you know, prison is kind of the extreme end of the spectrum where you're trying to control someone's every movement. And, uh, and you know, you have like kind of anarchy on the other side, which is, you, you know, you, that's not great either. You need some kind of like rules and norms to get, uh, to get things done in the world. Uh, there's, there's incredible benefits to coordination. Um, but, you know, my view, the schools, uh, you maybe you needed to do with that, like to get this industrial economy that we have that produces goods, you know, incredibly cheaply and has raised the standard of living globally. Um, but now I'm not, I'm not sure we need that. Right. I think computers have kind of taken on a lot of like the rote repetitive work and, uh, and you know, there's, there are fewer jobs where you can go be told what to do and do it and, and like be considered to be doing a good job. And so, we need to rethink that approach. Like it, it is, it is like a, a prison in some sense. And, and we need to, you know, I think we just need to like push it a little bit far in the other direction. So one thing you keep bringing up that I think is important is it's not so much that, uh, this is broken because it's always been broken. It's almost like the goalpost moved right in terms of the skill set that's needed, the, um, the way that people needed to think like all of that has changed. And therefore, you can't use the system that got us here to get us to where we need to go, right? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think also, also, I, I do think it has gotten worse. Like all the teachers I talk to, they're like, "This has gotten worse. It wasn't. It wasn't like this like ten years ago." So you had these things where the system starts to break down a little bit, and you'll be kind of familiar with this with the financial system and like Bitcoin and everything. It breaks down a little bit. The authorities respond by trying to control things even more. And so that's where you get these, you know, these in, in the U.S. you have programs that come from the Department of Education uh, and they're Republican, they're pushed by Republicans and Democrats and they're like raise standards. Let's have a common core. Like let's 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 do what we've been doing, but let's do it better and faster. And that's made things much worse. The testing has gotten much worse. And I think that is that's a sign that that, that, that this this kind of facade is starting to crumble, right? It's like people are aware of it. The teachers are aware of it. They don't want to be doing what they're forced to do. The kids realize it because I think kids are pretty smart. They can see, they, they, they could see that this is not going to get them where they want to be in life. Even from a young age, I really believe that. They, they're just like, why? Why am I doing this? The, the world looks nothing like what I'm doing here. Even from like a really young age, I think they can tell that. What's the analogy of like sand in someone's hand and as they go to like grab the sand, it actually you pushes it out. More. And uh, so you start squeezing it more and more, right? Mm, the sand is I haven't heard faster. that. Yep. Um, and so I think it's important to separate, like you said, the system from the people. The teachers, for the most part, from what I understand, and the administrators, they want to do the best they can for the kids. Right. They're not, like, they're like, not doing it for the money. Everybody knows like it's it doesn't pay a lot of money to be a teacher, right? So they're not doing it for the money. I mean, I, you meet some people who are just like you know, they're just phoning it in and they're just like, this is, you know, this is like a, a job where I get summers off or something like that. Right. I mean, there's, there are those people. It's just, it's, there's 3 million teachers in the U S right. Some of them are going to be bad people. But for me, like the vast majority I met, like they want to do this because they want to have an impact on kids. They care about kids and they basically just don't let them do what, what they want to do. Like you, you're, instead it's like, you're forcing these kids to learn math. You're grading them. You're not really, you don't have the time to treat them as individuals or see them as individuals. So would the teachers change the system if they could for the most part? 
Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's it's a really funny thing. There's just, I think the biggest enemy, I wrote an essay about this, like what comes after the industrial education complex. I think the biggest enemy is just inertia. I think no matter how high you go up the chain, you know, you, you find very few people who believe what we're doing now is a good idea and that we should keep doing it at, at any level. What about like the actual education? So we've talked a lot about like structure and regimen and uh, essentially making kids not be kids by telling them to shut up and sit down and, you know, don't move and all that stuff. Uh, are they actually learning important information? Like two plus two still equals four. And I think that'll happen for a long time. Uh, so kids need to know that, right? So like math and science to me feels like that's like the most objective thing in terms of uh, people think that there's certain topics within those disciplines that should be taught. And it's pretty easy to know, hey, you either know two plus two equals four or you don't. But then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that goes into an education where um, do we feel like they're actually learning the information or is it simply just rote memorization, get to that final test at the end of the year, basically regurgitate it all on the test and then like literally come back a month after the test and they don't know any of it. Yeah. I think Paul Graham just, I think he pretty recently wrote an essay about this. Like that you, you know, people aren't learning because you study for tests. You don't need to st- test to just be like, okay, what did you learn over, over this course? Right. The fact that you're studying for it means like you don't, you don't really know it well enough in, in that form. And so it's like, if your mind is like a sieve, like all this information that's not relevant, just just wash it, just goes right through, right? And uh, yeah, so that, that's that is going to be very difficult to fix in the existing system. Uh, one one of the things I could say is we the world's like evolving. You know, since we've gotten to the information age, evolution, evolution of our ideas, evolution of like what's important is taking place much faster than it ever has. And so, you know, you'll see it with like the Bitcoin community, these institutions that are kind of there, they, you could start an institution and run it kind of more or less the same way for, for, you know, a couple decades or like a century and it, it would be all right. Now things are changing much too quickly in this, this like giant system that we have, it's just not going to be able to change quickly enough, just never going to happen. So we need like an internet native education system, something that can change as quickly as the world changes, something that can evolve as quickly as the world is evolving now. So somebody else who realized this was Elon Musk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, walk me through the story of what was his realizations or your understanding of his realizations and then like what did he do to build this school on SpaceX, SpaceX's campus? I think it just started with like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't, I don't know his kids do well personally, but I think they're, you know, you, you might be able to infer that they're, uh, they're quite intelligent, right? And, uh, so, so what would give you that idea? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, th- I think that's, that's not like revealing too much to say. And, uh, you know, he had them in this school, which was, uh, which was this, in a gifted school in Los Angeles and was just, I think started with like an intuition, like well, this just isn't working. Like, I don't know exactly, you know, he, what, what to do, but like, this isn't working. And so Josh, our, you know, co-founder of Synthesis was a, was a teacher at that school. And if you can imagine this, like you're, you're a teacher, you know? Elon walks in like parent teacher conference night and it's like, Hey, I really don't like this school. I don't think it's doing a good job. And you're like, sorry, Elon Musk. <laughs> and, uh, but Elon follows us up with like, let's just do our own thing. Like, what would you do if you, if, you know, we just gave you the resources and you could just create it from scratch. Cause you know, my, my kids like you like what you're doing. Like, what would you do? You know, let's and Josh like that. You know, that sounds amazing. Like a billionaire just walked it. in my classroom and said that I could start a new school. <laughs> yeah. And do what any you know, Josh has the same point of view, right? He's like this system, even when you're at this, you know, you can imagine Elon's got all the resources in the world. He's got access to any school that he wants. LA is one of the biggest cities in America. Right. And he just can't find what he's looking for uh, because these, the, you know, it's all kind of like the same system. They're just doing what the public schools are doing, but doing it faster and, and, you know, calling that innovative. And so he gave an interview with, um, with Chinese television vision station, you know, I think it was like seven or eight years ago now before they started the school and, uh, two, two main, you know, Elon's famous for this first principles approach, right? So those first principles in education are just stop doing the industrial system thing. Stop treating the kids. Like everybody's going to learn the same thing at the same time. Stop segregating them by age and, and enforcing them through this like linear curriculum. So that was number one. And number two was make it problem focused rather than tool focused so school tends to divide things up into subjects and they're teaching you like a different tool 
in each subject. So his analogy is if school is going to teach you to be a mechanic or an engineer, they'd say, here's a course on wrenches. Here's your course on screwdrivers. And the way that you should do it is here's an engine to take apart. All right. So there's a problem. How are you going to solve it? Well, you need to learn how to use this tool. You need to learn how to use a screwdriver and a, and a wrench. And that is much more meaningful and engaging to kids, but to, to everybody. Like we're engaged in problems. Uh, the, the analogy I always use, like, I don't like accounting. Accounting is not really attractive to me, but like, I, I know a lot. I actually, actually kind of do like it because you need to do accounting to, you need to know a little bit to solve this problem of like, how do you build a company? How do you bring your ideas out into the world? And so I think, you know, people are the same way. If you try to teach these things in isolation, just much harder to learn. It just, it, it doesn't stick with us. And so Josh took that idea of being problem focused and started creating these games and simulations because like okay what are what are kids going to be engaged with if you say engagement is the most important thing they're going to like they like games you know they like simulations things they can play with things that are like interactive and so he starts creating these uh for, for the school and uh and he adds this element of like team sports to it right so it's like you collaborate on a team and then you're competing with the other teams and uh you know, start, started operating the school like that i think i went down in year year three or four to visit. And, um, you know, it was like, it, I'd done the little tour of the school and it was lunchtime. We we're sitting outside, uh, you know, it's California, it's warm. The kids are playing like dodgeball outside. And then there's a group of kids that's inside gather around a table, like standing up the computers in front of them and just shouting these really complex arguments at each other. And I turned to the teacher as I was eating with, I was like, what, what's going on here? And she's like, Oh, I'm sorry. That's, that's synthesis. You know, the kids get a little bit obsessed with it. I was like, this is a school thing. They've never seen kids act like this. And then what they're saying is just sounds like really complex. They're like 10, 11, 12. And I'm like, they're the way they're speaking with each other, the quality of their analysis is, you know, it's equivalent to what we're seeing in the office, like building this tech company, which is like scaling remarkably. And I and I had just had this feeling like this is this is the future. Like I'm seeing the future of education. I've been to all these schools, like as part of my work at uh, at Dojo. And, you know, I wasn't even excited to go down to Ad Astra because I was like, I just, I feel like I've seen it all, right? But this, this thing, this synthesis like stuck with me. And, you know, my son was two at the time. And so when the initial kind of shock of it wore off, my stomach just like sank because I'm like, I can't get this for him, right? If you're not, if you're not a billionaire with your own rocket company or you're not like a rocket engineer, no way to get your kids in there and even if you were an engineer at spacex it was like a one in 25 chance right because everybody wanted to go there and so i got, got like a little bit depressed because i've like seen the the promised land of education there's like no way to get to it so i started uh i started you know josh and i kept up like a conversation friendship we connected over this idea that kids crave complexity right that the, what you do in school is try to remove that complexity make everything rules based break it down into tiny chunks and he was like, you give them more complexity, they crave it, like they want it, they can, they can feel their minds like leveling up through that. And so we kind of built a friendship and would, would talk about like, you know, what the future should look like, tried to get them to move to the Bay Area where I live to start a school. And, uh, you know, you're working for Elon, you can't take on side projects for the most part. Um, so right when the pandemic hit, actually, that kind of you know, there's this wave of like online learning. People are open to it because they, you know, they're familiar with doing it, uh, you know, Zoom classes at their school. And so it wasn't a thing you had to sell people on anymore. They believed that you could learn that way, even if the schools are not doing it well. And also Elon's kids finished and they graduated the school. And so J Josh became like a, a free agent. And I was like, hey, like, why don't we, why don't we put this online? Let's see if it works online and let's see if it works with the kids of people who are not rocket engineers. And uh, yeah. So when a kid goes in here and I've seen yeah. it and uh, I invested in the last round today, we're going to announce a new round. Uh, so I'm a big believer in this, but what exactly do the kids do? They come in and is it on zoom? Like how does the product work and what are they doing when they're quote unquote in class? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, uh, it's a little different. Uh, one of our, our kind of slogans is embrace the chaos. So when kids sign up, we're like, you know, get ready. Here's the Zoom link. Just get ready. Get ready for chaos, right? So they come in, and a lot of them are used to the existing system. There's, you know, where there's rules, there's instructions. You're kind of told what to do. And we have a facilitator there. There'd be about 15 to 20 kids on a on a Zoom call, and the facilitator's like, "Welcome. 
We got a prop. We're here to learn to solve complex problems together. That's the critical skill. That's what we're going to teach you guys so you can build the future, whatever it looks like. And we're going to put you in breakout rooms on teams and you're going to have a problem to solve, figure it out. And then every hand goes up and they're like, what, what's the problem? Like, what, what do we, what do we do exactly? What are the rules? What am I not allowed to do? (laughs) We're going to give you the problem. It's going to be chaos and you're going to figure it out. So you put them in the breakout rooms. There's a, there's a game like a, or simulation that kind of comes up on the screen and they've got to figure it out. And it's, uh, and it's crazy. It's chaotic. Our first couple of sessions, we had kids, uh, some of the kids would like be in tears because it was so frustrating. Um, but then they, they get through it and they figure it out and it builds this confidence where like you took on the unknown, you took on the chaotic and you made sense of it and you figured it out and now you just want more. And so those are the parents that write to us, the kids that were like the most upset, the parents that write to us and be like, this has changed her mentality now. Like she's now when she sees these problems, she's like, she's attacking them. She's on offense. Like she's not afraid anymore. Like it's pretty incredible that you can do this just through these like simulations on zoom, but it's uh, you know, it mirrors life, right? The legacy system that we talked about in the beginning is all about rote memorization, no critical thinking, no problem solving, like literally sit down, shut up, don't move. Two plus two equals four. Okay. End of year. What's two plus two equal four. Great job. Go to the next grade. Like, you know, what's crazy by the way, is that when I visited so many classrooms and, uh, my realization was that I think kids are learning about 30 minutes a week. If you go to school for, you know, like 35 hours or so, I think they learn what they could learn in 30 minutes. I think it takes really? a week to give them 30 minutes. Yeah. I know that sounds extreme, but you know, if you're, if you're, if you have kids and they're doing like zoom calls, just go listen in on the zoom calls or, or go see if they'll let you visit the classroom and look at what they're doing. And I, I that, that's like my, I've been to a ton of class. I'm talking, not talking about like only like really, you know, kind of underfunded public schools. I'm talking about like private schools, like top notch public schools. I, the kids learn very, very, very little in school. So anyway, I wanted to, to right. interject that, but that's good. Carry on. Because the exact opposite of that is what synthesis is doing, which is saying it's the idea. We, we don't care if you know what two plus two equals four is in terms of like the memorization. What we want to do is give you a problem. And by the way, if at, at any point you have to do math, you're going to figure it out because you need the math to solve the problem. Yeah. Right. And it's much more focused on this, like problem solving, critical thinking, independent thought, leadership, communication, uh, teamwork, like, you know, I could go on and on and on. And this litany of uh, different skill sets that I'm going to describe sound a whole hell of a lot like what anybody who runs a business wants to hire for. Right. Yeah. It's somebody oh, yeah. who's got problem solving, complex uh, thinking skills, you know, first principles, leadership, teamwork, communication, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And so just on the face of like the structure. It's complexity, right? It's that industrial systems, you're trying to simplify things so that humans can act as parts in this in this bigger machine the machine itself is complex though and now you know where the world is going is like the the more you're able to handle complexity to manage complexity to manage to make sense out of chaos to synthesize you know those are those are the valuable jobs that's the the, that's the valuable skill is humanity's most valuable skill working together to solve complex problems that's elon's the canonical example right he's and it's good at individual level and good for the civilization. Elon, you know, arguably has done more for to move civilization forward than anybody alive. And and he's also, you know, the the richest man, like kind of incidentally, right? So it's a it's the most valuable skill, I would argue, that you can give to your kids. And and if enough people do this, it will actually move the civilization forward. Like we will be able to accelerate human progress. So what I think has blown me away is you can design all the best games, you can get kids to sign up, you can build a great business, whatever. It's hearing the kids talk. Mm -hmm. These kids talk better than literally people I worked with at Facebook. 100%. Right? And when I first started talking to you, you said something to me, and I didn't believe you. You said that you took some kids from Synthesis who had played these complex games, and you put them in competition with, I think it was Berkeley computer science kids uh engineering engineering graduate students okay oh engineering graduates and so even better than just like mechanical engineering or something like that yeah and they played these games and it was a slaughter 
Yeah, it was, it was a massacre. <laughs> but it wasn't in favor of the engineering graduate students. It was in favor of 10, 12, you know, 13-year-old kids. Yeah. Why is that? Why is it that somebody who has reached the pinnacle of the traditional education system and, you know, by all uh, kind of traditional metrics has, you know, achieved everything? Because what are you good at, right? If, you're, if, you're, if you've done really well in that system, what are you good at? It's not necessarily solving complex problems in chaotic environments quite the opposite you're really good at following the rules and solving these problems that are scoped for you and so they have the same problem that kids have you know when they're transitioning into synthesis for the first time is they're used to the way things working being like let's be told what to do you know get the right answer on this and with the chaotic environment with no one which is the way life works right no no one can really tell you precisely the rules or, or precisely like how to win the game of life like you, you need to figure that out for yourself and so the kids who've gone through synthesis they're they're used to that and these you know people who are at the pinnacle of the existing system are are kind of you know they're they're the opposite it almost is exactly what paul graham's talking about with like learning to unlearn right yeah. and his whole thing i think is uh and i think he uses the example of y combinator when people show up who are really good at school they say to paul like hey what do i do to fundraise Right. Mm -hmm. And what they're expecting him to say is, okay, send 100 emails, have 20 meetings, say, you know, this script, and then you get a million dollar investment and say, okay, thank you, Paul. Right. And they go and they hundred meetings or hundred emails, whatever. And they go through the system. Instead, what he says is like, no, like dummy, right? Like that's not the way to do it. Instead, the way to do it is like build a product that works. Right. And like that people want, and then like every investor will come to you and they'll be knocking down your door to give you money. And so it's very much like a prescriptive uh, type, you know, again, just rote memorization, here's what to do, go follow the rules and do it, versus actually getting at, from a first principle standpoint, what is the goal of the investors and what is going to elicit their interest? And so the, he says that a lot of times the people who are good at school have to unlearn what they've learned over the last however many years. It feels yeah. like you guys are almost getting to the kids before they actually learn some of that stuff, right? Like you're almost like cutting them off. And saying, hey, before you go down this path and get, you know, uh, kind of indoctrinated into the industrial education system, yeah. we're going to teach you a different way. And kids really gravitate towards that. Yeah, I think that's right. I think we're, I think it, it's a, li a little bit of like dose of freedom and the kind of confidence you get from like, whoa, no one told me the answer. I just figured that out. That out. And then you get the meta lesson. Oh, I can just figure things out on my own. That's crazy. School basically just grinds that idea out of us and it takes a long time because it's really counter to human nature. And you give kids a little bit of dose of like how things could be and, and that, that sticks. That ch I, think, I think even just a little bit might be enough inoculation against the kind of indoctrination that you'll get in school to keep your, keep your mind open and just, just internalize the idea that you can solve problems. And this is, this is what innovative people do. So they figure things out. For themselves they figure out how the game works on their own and they figure out how to how to break the rules in a way that that benefits other people and that's that's what we want more of that's what society needs more of so this works and as the founder you can't say that i can say that as an investor and we can just use metrics to prove it right so you have the idea once the pandemic kind of hits you guys do a little testing you really launched the subscription-based product that we know today in November of 2020? Yep, yep, first week of November, yep. Okay, so November 2020. How long does it take you from November to a million dollars in annualized revenue? I think it's, I think we hit it, uh, you know, like December 31st, so like about two months. Okay, so two months from zero to a million dollars in ARR. Mm -hmm. If we then look and uh, you raised a seed round, yep. right? And uh, it was myself, others. I don't know who wants to be said, who not. Pomp and friends. Yeah, let's say so, some <laughs> some friends. Some of you will know, uh, but all individual checks. Yeah. And then we announce it. We did it in a very specific way. We'll talk about that in a second. You now fast forward to uh, May are now doing over three million dollars in annualized revenue. That's right. So when you do that, you've raised five million dollars. Series A, $50 million post money valuation. Yeah. And when we look at this, why is it that you're able to go from zero to millions of dollars of annual recurring revenue in such a short period of time 
when it seems like every other business in the world struggles to find product market fit and scale revenue. Mm -hmm. Like that all happened in six months and you're very quickly continuing to scale and sign up more people. Like why is it working? Well, on the product market fit side, I mean, you have to remember Josh has been a teacher for 10 years. It's actually kind of rare for an ed tech startup to have a, an experienced teacher and like a founder role mm-hmm. from, from the outset. And what was he doing? He's, he's inventing new things for Elon school. So for seven of those years, you know, he's working for Elon, which is pretty, uh, pretty hardcore job, right? Like you're, you're, you know, you get a lot of anxiety and you're just trying to you make sure that you keep that job and like, and do a great job with it. So for seven years, he's running these like experiments with the kids there and refining the ideas. And he's got this, you know, intuition about, about what kids need and, and want. And so it's, uh, we did not, we did not exactly start, you know, just, just six months ago, we had all that background knowledge and the, the challenge is like translating that to an online environment, right? Taking it from in-person kind of like, uh, on, on paper, you may be using Excel spreadsheets to keep score to like put it, put it online in the software. Um, so that's the first part of that. And then second, you know, I think we go back before November, we, um, Anna, Anna Fabrega, um, joined us. She's, uh, she's our chief evangelist and she's got this, you know, I think the world's biggest Twitter following may be focused on new ways to, to educate kids. So she was a teacher as well. Like spent four years as a teacher, you know, face to face with kids every day. You get that intuition for what works when you do that. And when she, we met on Twitter, brought her in to check out some of the sessions and she was like, wow, like this is, this is it. So she wrote like a thread about the company announcing it on Twitter. That brought this influ- influx of customers. That's how we got from zero to, to a million in the first two months. And also, you know, connected with, with you, which is, uh, which was, which is, you know, just, just kind of move access to more of these like networks, people on Twitter. So I, I think it's like, if you were going to do this and you're going to go sell it to schools and sell it to the existing system, like one of the problems is, you know, the, the, as much as the administrators, like district administrators, would want to do the right thing for kids, you know, it's they don't have the same kind of uh, anxiety that a parent has, right? Like if you're sending your kids to school and you feel like this is not the right way to educate your kids, you're looking for something else and you're eager for solutions for that. And so when we tap into these networks on Twitter, it's, you know, people who follow you or people who follow Anna, they're looking for new ways to do things. They're used to turning to the internet to solve their problems and just, you get the right thing out in front of them. They're like, it clicks and uh, they're off to the races. I want to talk about fundraising strategy. Um, as far as I know, you have zero institutional venture investors in the company. We have a little, um, we have uh, Sam Teller, who's Elon's former chief of staff during, during like the Model 3 days, which had to be one of the craziest jobs in the world. Um, so he's he's a venture partner in their, Val, he works at Valor, and so Valor venture partners are in, but like as, not as part of the fund, right? It's like seed and, you know, angels okay. effectively. So but yeah, apart from that, all angels. Okay. And the reason why I think you and I kind of saw eye to eye almost immediately, I think we literally had like a, five minute conversation. We're like, yeah, we shouldn't take any venture money. We should just go take it from you, all these You angels. just ruin, you ruin us on traditional VCs, <laughs> right? Cause we're like, call you and you're like, all right, like how much, how much you need? And I'm like, well, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to do X and you're like, okay, done. Like send me the paperwork. I'll sign. I'll give you the money. And it's like, all right. And also, by the way, here's a bunch of my friends who are going to invest too, and are going to help you, you know, <laughs> with the narrative. So it's uh, it'll be tough to go back. <laughs> so we essentially have prioritized people with I would categorize it as three things. People who co-invested in this round are folks with large online audiences, Yep, have very specific companies that they have built and run that have very large distribution, or are very well-versed, usually as founders, in things that you as a CEO, as you continue to build the business, are going to go through. Yep. And so it feels like Distribution was never a thing that investors brought to the table. Now they do. Advice usually was, but it usually wasn't directly from the investor in many cases. A lot of times it was them just connecting you to these people. Yeah. And then when it came to hiring and these other things, it was just a numbers game. Like, hey, how do we get you in front of enough candidates and you find the best one and you hire it? And so it almost feels like in some weird way, because now all of these people either have personal capital or they have their own like angel funds or whatever. Uh we've been able to assemble how many investors on this last round? 
Ooh, I think it's something something like 45. All right, so 45 people, give or take, plus or minus you know, 10 or 15 on either side. 45 people that, as we announced it today, are likely to drive way more impact than what a traditional venture investor could do. Yep. Is this going to just be the norm? Or is it specific to companies like yours that are consumer-focused, that have a very kind of um, outlier-type story where it's, when people hear it, they're just like, oh, of course, like that's a thing. Um, and so you kind of need almost like a, a company needs product market fit. Here, you almost need like investor product fit. And so your mm-hmm. company is specifically aligned with this type of strategy, whereas others might not be. Yeah, I think I think that that's right. I mean, it's of course the story, the backstory is is helpful for attracting attention. Um, but we are inspired by um, by primarily Mateo at Eight Sleep and, and what they've done on on Twitter to promote the product, and then Austin Allred at Lambda School, and they're they're both investors in this round now. Um, so you could you could see what they've done, you could see that it worked. It's it's uh you know you're effectively uh, we 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 cannot always as humans just like think through everything from principles ourselves, we have to rely on people that we trust. And so you can think of the kind of shorthand for the round is like who has trust at scale. Like, is it, it's not, it's not that you have an audience that's so valuable. It's that you have an audience who trusts you. So, and you, you have skin in the game. You cannot mislead them. You'll lose your audience or they're not going to follow you anywhere. So you have the skin in the game and all the other investors who have audience, they have the skin in the game where like if they're recommending something to you, right, it's, it's something that they actually believe in because the incentives are aligned there. And it's, you know, I, I just think it's the most obvious thing in the world. These VCs are, are essentially selling cash, which is a commodity and it's not scarce. The scarce thing is that trust at scale. And so VCs are sort of getting unbundled the same way the education system is going to get unbundled and, uh, you know, it's a, it's an interesting kind of new world. I, I don't think we're going to be the last company to, uh, to do it this way. I think this is going to be the norm. Uh, I'm betting my career that you're not going to be. <laughs> um, I think another interesting part of this, and I don't want to say any names, uh, they can say it if they want, uh, is we've got some very, very helpful venture capital investors. They just did it personally rather than through their funds. And yeah. that was kind of the thought process, right? Was they individually could be very helpful. Let's get them in the fund itself is almost added bureaucracy that's unnecessary. Yeah, I, th- I think that's right. I mean, I, I just think increasingly people don't know who the, who the VC funds, those, those names don't matter as much as the individuals, right? The individuals, if, if you look at people who have companies and then in like the founders are on Twitter or, you know, the principals are on Twitter, uh, the, it's the person that gets most of the attention, right? People want to connect with people, not, institutions and so that's uh you know I, I to me it doesn't seem like particularly insightful you can just look at twitter and like see what's going on it just feels like the most obvious thing in the world to me um there's another factor with us specifically where we've, we've been cash flow positive like pretty much since the beginning like i, I started off i wasn't sure if it was going to be because we didn't know like it's only like rocket engineers kids doing this in the in the whole world like 30 handpicked like rocket engineers kids and so i'm like i just have no idea if this is going to be like a, a venture business, like, is this going to, is this something that's for everybody? We had no clue. So I kind of like funded it myself initially and wasn't, didn't want to raise the money because didn't want that pressure before we kind of figured out the shape of this thing. And so that helped because we were cash flow positive. So when we go to raise money, it's not about the money. Like we, we would have gotten you on the cap table for free. <laughs> you only told me that after I had signed. <laughs> I mean, the money's nice, but it's, it's, you know, it's basically so the seed round is sat in the bank and like, we've, you know, we just got a little bit more money than uh than we originally raised because it wasn't about the money like you cannot buy the kind of like the kind of trust like the kind of audience um that you have and that some of our other investors have right it's it's much more like a world based on trust and i think it's a that's more honest like truthful world to live in and yeah i'm excited about it i think either the first or second call we ever had you literally were told me you're never gonna raise money and i was like all right i don't have to convince this guy to raise any money <laughs> like that like usually founders are like begging for money right they're like you know i'm gonna raise a ton of money and you were just like yeah we don't need the money like we're profitable like this thing's just gonna go um and so i think that like it's very obvious look the product the way that you're approaching the education like everything is very different the fundraising strategy has been very different uh, we can layer in one other aspect that's very different, which is the way that uh, we've announced this stuff. 
So in the seed round, did you talk to any reporters? Or was it just the investor base and podcasts essentially that did all the distribution? Yeah, I didn't even consider it. That's kind of I think you you brought it up one time or maybe maybe a little bit after the seed round. Like, all right, we'll get some mainstream press. And I, I think I I was like, why? Why is it? And you can see, right? Like, because I don't. We should share this chart, right? I've I've texted it to you and texted it to some of the other investors. There's like there's the pomp effect, right? Where I show people the graph, and I'm like, tell me where pomp made his announcement. It's like the most obvious, just this massive spike. That's like you know, it spikes and then it comes down, but it's at a permanent higher level, right? And it's it's completely insane. Whenever I show it to people, they're like, yeah, wow, okay, like traditional VCs are you no. Know, there's no one that's going to be able to do this for you. It, it's um. Austin Reef, uh, yeah, he, he, who is a, an investor, uh, texted me. I guess you had sent him the chart, yeah. and all he responded, I think, uh, was he said, "Saw the chart, lol." Right, <laughs> just like <laughs> it is crazy. Just yeah. like okay, like yeah, this works. And I think part of it also, you go back to like this trust aspect is when you lose control of the narrative, you actually can lose control of the trust with the audience or with the potential customer base as well, right? Because to me, it's, uh, you get one shot in, Hey, here's what it is. Here's how it works. Here's why you should care. And actually that's not what the goal of traditional press is. Traditional press is you're trying to get legitimacy, right? The distribution comes with the legitimacy, but you're trying to get validation and legitimacy and Hey, we were featured in X or Y publication. Yeah. But I think you're right in that, like, on the internet, would you rather get featured in a mainstream press or mentioned by the person in your industry who's got the largest audience and the most trust with that? It's actually almost like that individual now is the same thing as, like, the trade publication used to be, right? Yeah. Like, they have the audience and they have the trust and the engagement. And therefore, if you look at it almost like rather than just general distribution, but targeted distribution. Yep. They have more targeted distribution than the mainstream organizations. Yeah, the, the mainstream is like, I mean, I don't I don't think I read, I don't read anything in the mainstream except like people post on Twitter to like dunk on it and show, show you how they're lying or like misinformed, right? So there's this uh, audience, there's kind of like a psychological alignment with the audience, which I, I, I wasn't sure when we, when we brought you on as a seed investor, like I knew Anna's audience, like it's okay. People who are interested in the future of education, like I think that's going to work pretty well to drive in customers. But what about an audience is primarily like investors, like Bitcoiners. But I, I had the hypothesis that, you know, Bitcoin is like, there's just energy behind disrupting this legacy financial system. So you, you kind of have to be, you know, a free thinker to, uh, to, con to consider, you know, if you don't trust Bitcoin the banks, thing. you definitely don't trust the schools. Exa exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's the most succinct way to put it. Right. So, so I thought there might be some psychological alignment with the audience there. And that's, uh, you know, that that's proven right. And, th and those are the people we want. Like, we don't want the people who are like, uh, you know, wins the test. Can you give my kid a grade on this? Can you, you know, can you make it basically more like this, the principles of this existing system? Like we don't, we're not going to do that. And Josh has been really helpful there because he's used to dealing with like people who, who want that, like like very wealthy people who are like, you know, want him to do things a certain way. And he's just used to being like, it's not the place for you, right? Like you, you, you can join or you can not join. I don't care, but like, we're going to do it this way. And by this is the way Elon wants it done. So like, if you don't want it that way, then you go do your own thing. That's fine. When you think about where this is going, uh, right now, most of the students, not all of them, but most of them are between the ages of, let's call it eight and 14 based in the United States or North America. Is that fair to categorize at all? Most. Okay. Yeah. There's students from all over the world. I was going to say there yeah. are students though. Uh, when I made the seed investment announcement, I literally had a dad who messaged me from India and said, my kid is in the course and, uh, I love it. This is amazing. Right. And I remember thinking to myself, based on when I know the courses are run, that's not a normal time that a kid is awake in India. Right. No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's right. And, and so like, it's just a date. It's just one piece of data out of a whole plethora of them. But this idea that like, wait a second, this is so important that kids are staying up or waking up earlier or whatever to go do this in other parts of the world makes me think that actually, if you can figure out logistically, you can go serve a very high percentage of children in the world with this type of education 
And you don't have to replace school. It can just be supplemental for a very long period of time. But from a pure like ROI, you're going to get way more out of this than you are out of the traditional education system. Is that fair to categorize how you think about it? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Josh, one of his principles is like you, you kids have a limited amount of time, just like anybody else. If you're going to, you know, if you're going to do something for their education, you want to be the best possible use of their time, right? If you, if you do that um, throughout their kind of childhood, they're just going to be in a much better position compared to if you do something where it's like sitting in a desk and you're, you're wasting hours and you're not learning anything useful. Like it's it's criminal when you if when you really think about it. I, I really do think this is, you know, you might disagree. You might say it's the financial system, but I think this industrial education system is the single largest bottleneck holding back human progress. I think people in the future are going to look back and be like, I cannot believe we institutionalized kids this way. And as you said, it's 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 global, right? Dif- different places they have different school systems, but they're all for the most part kind of built on this industrial model. And, and your audience is from all over the world and, and our customers are from all over the world. And uh, I don't know if we're talking about the same guy, but that's there's at least one parent in India that's like, yeah, the kid is, this kid wakes up at 4.30 a.m. And I, I'm not forcing him to do it. He's just like, I really want to be in synthesis. I'll get up at 4.30 a.m. before school and, and take the synthesis courses. So that's it's pretty amazing for people to have that kind of excitement about it. There are two problems in the world today that every other problem can be drawn back to mm-hmm. and it's money and education and that's it Agreed. and the people who control or influence the money system are super bureaucratic frankly they are full of shit as a system and their internet has exposed them yep the system that teaches education is super bureaucratic they're full of shit right and the internet has exposed them And what I think we're getting is we're essentially getting um, disruption in a very unique way. Because I think that what's really made me be, you know, kind of so positive on this and just like, yes, this is a a solution. It doesn't have to be the solution, but a solution. Yeah. Is you can look at the school system and you can be like, this is broken. And you can do one of two things. You can be the victim or you can be the person on offense trying to fix something, Right. And a lot of parents, I think, actually, like, just go search it on Twitter. Like, I literally did it. I went and I searched and, like, school sucks, right? And, like, type that in Twitter. <laughs> you will find a bunch of t- parents being, like, school sucks, right? My kid doesn't learn anything. Or, like, you know, you just go use these phrases. And then you're like, okay, well, what are you doing about it? And to me, it's almost worse. Like, they know that it doesn't work, but they're not doing anything. And some of them just don't have another option, right? Like, literally, that's what they have to do. They have to go to work. They, they don't have any other options in their hometown, whatever. It's hard. I mean, even even for me, like, we've, we were, you know, we're doing fine financially. My wife, uh, you know, is, is, is a stay-at-home mother. And so we've got the time and the resource to figure this out. And, and it's hard. It's, it's still hard. Completely agree. But you, Josh, others are choosing to go do something about it, right? And I think that, like, that's where you actually get solutions. The other thing actually almost makes it um, more bureaucratic in a way. Because now a school spends, you know, what used to be 1% of their time dealing with like customer complaints, right? Like parent complaints. Now it's 3% of their time, 5%. Like at some point, it's actually 20% of the school administrator's time is spent with like parents complaining that it doesn't work. And it redirects energy from actually like teaching the kids. Whereas with this, you basically just say, hey, we have a different option. Like, you know, don't complain. Like, Vote with your feet and vote with your dollars, as Bellagio always says. I, I think, yeah, Bellagio's like concept of of exit is like something I think about a lot. I, I'm calling this like the there's sort of like a soft exit from the system right now, where you know, there's myself included for this year. Like we have our have our one child in a traditional school, um, but you know, I, I I tell them just like don't you know bring a book and like read when they're doing the lessons, like so you can get something out of it, and then we'll do synthesis and we'll learn. Uh, like there's no way I'm leaving your learning, your cognitive development up to just who happened, the people who happen to live, you know, within a 30 mile radius of our home. Like the, the best of the, the best is going to be on the internet. And like, that's, that's what I want you doing. So I, th- I do think that that's kind of like how things are going to evolve. There's obviously it's important to get kids together in person, but what's really exciting is if you unbundle these things, you can get them together in person to be kids. Like school could just be recess, like four or five hours a day. I think that'd be fine. If you then spend some time reading, some time doing things like synthesis that are really kind of 
compressing your the time that you're spending like focused on learning specifically just just compress that time and uh and then you've got time to be a kid time to explore like all, all the things that we want our our kids to do um so yeah it's crazy to think about how different the world would look if everyone was able to learn independent thinking problem solving critical thinking skills early rather than 90 plus percent of society literally just being told what to do and what to think and not how to think it's impossible to imagine i mean literally impossible to imagine right because all these kids like some people their psyche kind of survives the existing system like you 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 survive with some innovative ability intact and like obviously people do right but it's it was a nightmare for the teachers that dealt with me while i was in school <laughs> yeah yeah me, me too and I, I i feel bad for uh for a lot of the trouble i caused in school but uh but but yeah you, you know it's, it's some people kind of you know they're, they're able to maintain that kind of spirit of like human ingenuity in spite of the system like what if you have a system that encourages that well you, you literally can't imagine when you start getting you know a million kids a year like educated in this way or, or 10 million 100 million the things that they will create to improve the society literally unimaginable yeah and, uh, incredibly exciting time to be alive you have three ch- children that's right what age there's seven, almost five, and almost two. Two, All right. two older ones are boys. And are you going to take girl. them out of traditional education and put them in synthesis exclusively? Is that a possibility in the future that synthesis is a replacement, or does it stay supplemental? Like, how do you just think about the evolution of this? Yeah, we're we're exploring it. So I, I like I announced this on Twitter that my oldest, who's uh, who's seven, is going. We we you know canceled the uh, tuition for the following year, and he's doing synthesis with uh. We call it synthesis junior, so that it's like six and seven year olds. It's traditionally been, you know, only only up, you know, eight, age eight. So we we're we we're experimenting with doing it a little bit younger. Um, we had I think thirteen hundred applications for for about fifteen spots um, when we when we put this out on Twitter, and I just kind of told everybody like, all right, you know, look, skin in the game, like I'm burning the boats behind us. Like this is this is how I'm going to educate my kids. So. You can at least know if you enroll your kids, like it's, I'm not selling you something that, uh, I don't believe in myself. Like this is my kids are going to be in this. So I'm paying attention to it. Right. I'm paying attention <laughs> to the experience and, uh, and yeah, it's, uh, we don't have it figured out yet, but it's, uh, but it's thrilling. And I think there will be, there will be at least some part of synthesis, like anybody can do for like an hour or two a week. And then there'll be some part of it. That's like a, more like a full stack online school. You're not going to want to answer this, but uh, would we be better off? Like, does school do more damage than it does good? The traditional, like, industrial education system. Is it a net positive or net negative for students? And compared to what? Right? I mean, like, there's, I think if maybe you just, uh, you know, you just let kids roam free on the streets. Is that going to be better? Like probably in some places that'd be better. And probably in some places that's going to be worse. So I, you know, you're always trying <laughs> Depends to compare where you're roaming. these things. <laughs> the real question is like, can, can we do better? Is there going to be progress or is this just the way things are? And I think what, I, what I tend to think about there is, uh, there's this idea like the Lindy effect, right? So the ideas that have been around for a while will, will tend to survive a little, like a while longer new ideas will you know just statistically are more likely to die out quickly i think it's important people realize the system is a hundred years old that's it it's not been like this for all of human history it's a hundred years old and you know maybe i think it probably passed the midpoint of its usefulness maybe sometime in like the 1960s 1970s and i think it's like on the decline now so i I think we're we're going to see progress like and it's funny like even silicon valley like investors are supposed to be investing in the future will have this idea that like no it just it just feels like same way the financial system feels it's like it's going to be this way forever because you grew up with it that way but if you take a longer view historically this is this is unnatural it's a it's a new idea that we should you know segregate kids by age and have them learn as if they were machines and it's not going to last. So I think there's going to be progress. And uh, yeah. I just thought of this idea. So I'm just going to say it. We should live stream me playing against some of the kids and see who wins. And I say live stream because if I lose, I'll never admit it. So you'll at least have it so other people know. But I think like that is part of it, right? Is that's how you teach people like this works is yeah you, know, you could literally bring in like bring in the venture capitalist who thinks it doesn't work like cool play the 13 year old 
Yeah. Right. When yeah. the 13 year old smokes you, you're going to walk away with your pride kind of hurt a little bit, but also like, oh, wait, maybe my kid should be in this. Well, it's, it's this is why we start with younger kids, right? So, so something I think about pretty often is there aren't any, there aren't world-class athletes or musicians who start like in their twenties. Right. But that's the way all of us are when we start, you know, if you're starting like building companies or innovating, creating things like most of us, just the early part of our life is just, is just kind of wasted. And then we have to pick it up later. And, uh, you know, the, your, your brain, your body just don't, they don't adjust the same way after, after childhood, like adolescence, like there's famously like you, if you don't acquire language by a certain age, like you, you can't do it. Right. So your brain is more plastic. So it's kind of like frightening that these kids are kind of like uh they're raised in complexity if you're going through synthesis like you're they're this is just going to be the norm for them and the, the more complex we make it it's kind of like this in ender's game like they they keep uh increasing the difficulty of the games until the kids are just like way beyond what the adults could do because they realize you know the kids brains are more plastic they can they can pick up the new ways quicker than we can so it's compounding too right like that's right. I, I think if you take two you know 8 year olds and you start them out in year one, and the eight-year-old that goes through synthesis is 5% better than mm-hmm. the eight-year-old who went through the traditional system. Okay, it's 5%. Some people are like, who cares, right? But if you extrapolate that out and that continues, right, and you get compounding in synthesis that you don't get in the kind of traditional system, mm-hmm. by the time they're 15, that's not even close. Like, that's the difference between Harvard and community college, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, I mean, yeah. in, in the old system, like, that's yeah. literally the complete opposite ends of the spectrum yeah. on just pure time and kind of persistence in a different system that ends up being better. Yeah. And I think that's, this is, we're going to start sharing more of this stuff. Like we've brought on this new round of investors. So we've got kind of like a good, a good solid platform to reach people. Uh, we've shared just like one video so far of a 10 year old called Emmett, right? He's only, he's been in synthesis for like six months, right? It's not, not like, and he years. sounds better than a lot of people on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. And, and the comment we get a lot is like, well, you've just, uh, this is like just some, some rich kid or some like, so this is like, they picked like you the one genius pick. kid. Like, like, no, you, you just, you have no idea what kids are capable of. And we're going to start putting more of this stuff out there from a variety of kids. Like we're, you know, we're not cherry picking. It's just that, you know, they, they pick things up quickly. And if you give them that, uh, that sort of like playground for the mind to, to play around in, they stay engaged with that. The results are are shocking. And that's what I saw when I was at Ad Astra, I was seeing these kids in like year four of doing synthesis. And I was just like, what the hell is going on? Like, I, I, I couldn't imagine it. Um, I remember sending, sending some like audio of that to my friend and him being like, these are these are like second year law students, right? There's, there's no way these are like 12, 13 year olds. And just like, like literally just couldn't believe it. And uh, yeah, it's that that's that compounding effect, right? I think that it is exactly what the world needs, which is why I'm excited to invest. And I think the craziest part for me is like forget all the company building stuff, forget all of um, the like excitement around uh, building a team and scaling it and all that. It's just like when you teach kids this, like even if you said to me, hey, we're only going to teach 100 kids, that's all we're ever going to be able to impact. There's a very good probability those 100 kids go on to do some pretty crazy shit in the world that we all end up pointing at and being like, you know what? Like that person's special. And it's not because you're doing anything uh, or you've got some special power. You're just literally teaching them a different way of thinking that actually ends up lending itself to being very, very effective in this kind of chaotic, uncertain, you know, problem ridden world. And so in some crazy way, I think most people are going to make the mistake of evaluating the value and the impact of synthesis from a, how much money do you make? How many students came through the program? Like whatever. But instead you can look at it as like, what is the increase in productivity in the world from the students that went through the program? And we won't know that for a long time, but if it goes the right way, you know, if the next Elon Musk goes through the program and you end up, you know, building a very, very successful business. Is it more important that the business was successful or the next Elon Musk was taught how to think the right way and do it? Like actually the student's impact is going to be, you know, it's going to way outweigh anything that a business can do by itself. Yeah, absolutely. I think all of our other problems are downstream of education, right? So if you can fix that, you can solve 
you know, clean energy, access to clean water. We can get flying cars. Finally, we can get, uh, we can get all, all, all in the future can be, um, can be amazing and like kind of unlimited in, in infinite ways. And it's, it's like things have gotten better in human society over the centuries since, since the enlightenment began. And, you know, we can, we can improve on that though. We're not, we're not done. Like things can improve in a limitless fashion. And I completely agree with what you, what you say about like the, the value of it is in, we don't, this, this, the, we'll go back to what I said earlier, solving complex problems together. That's what makes humans unique. That is the most valuable skill. We know there's some general component to it because people like Elon or like Jack Dorsey can succeed in multiple domains. We don't know how to confer that skill or cultivate it at scale yet. And if we can figure that out, it's to me, it's like a game changer for human society. It'll be like a before and after moment. Bitcoiners like to say, fix the money, fix the world. Synthesis may just start saying, fix the education, fix the world. So it's basically the same thing. That's right. All right. Where can we send people? If you're, if you got a kid between the ages of what, eight and 14? Uh, you can, you can, so you can apply now if you're, if you're six, uh, six or seven, but there's just know that there's like a, a wait list. So if you want to get in, I'd, that, that I'd recommend like going ahead and getting your application in now and we'll be accepting on a rolling basis. But yeah, if you're between eight and 14, you can, uh, you can enroll. Um, there's a little bit of a wait list, but you'll get in fairly quickly. And the website is synthesis.is. Synthesis.is. That's right. All right. Go sign up. And when they ask you where you found it, say pop, just so they keep thinking that I'm smart, even though they're doing all the hard work. <laughs> <laughs> and then they'll be like, oh, look at this big spike. <laughs> and I'm like, that has nothing to do with me. But yeah, I appreciate the credit. <laughs> um, and then where can people find you on Twitter? Uh, Twitter, I'm uh, at Chrisman Frank. Awesome. Thank you. Please keep going. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the help.